Okay, so uh, we're very happy to have uh, Johannes Kellendonk with us today from the University of Lyon, well, he's with us virtually. Um, and he's agreed to give us an introduction to um, non-commutative topological approach to topological phases. So Johannes, it's all yours. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you in particular, Benoit Dussault, qui m'avait demandé de le faire. Et j'ai compris que l'idée, c'était de donner une sorte de résumé, un, un overview mm -hmm. to, to the techniques uh, of non computer topology uh, for topological phases. So oui, si the plan faire, would be... Un petit commentaire, c'était en partie une demande intéressée parce que personnellement, je, 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 je sens bien qu'il y a un intérêt dans la communauté physique, mais ça reste des méthodes qui, qui sont quand même en général difficiles d'accès pour le physicien tel qu'il est formé actuellement. Ça changera peut-être, mais donc voilà, c'est très important pour nous que des mathématiciens nous aident un peu à rentrer dans, dans ces approches. Voilà, c'était juste un commentaire, disons que c'était une demande aussi en partie intéressée. Oui, <laughs> Can we switch to one language? Sure. Me. Uh, okay. Uh, I have to admit that I um, sometimes don't realize whether I speak French or English. Mm. So uh, please tell me if I, I switch mm. without warning. So, so what I would like to do, as I said, I wanted to give you an overview. And uh, uh, this is based on what I would call the C-star algebraic approach to solid state physics which was proposed by Jean Belissard, I think in 1984, in the context of the quantum Hall effect. And if time permits, I would like to address uh, uh, several points. So I would like to first explain you just uh, how you describe topological phases in the one particle approximation. And then I would like to convince you, and, and we'll put some time in it, that the K-theoretic formulation of, topolog of topological phases it's very, very natural. I am convinced that uh, K-theory would have been invented by physicists at this point if it didn't exist already. Mm. Now, uh, I think Benoit's interest when he asked me was in particular uh, subjects in topological phases and brought in some uh, new uh, ideas into this proposal by Jean Belissard to describe uh, solids by C-star algebras. Mm -hmm. I will then talk about boundary invariance and KK classes. And something which is at the heart of topological insulators is the bulk boundary correspondence. And I think partic in particular here, the power of K-theory comes into play because it's very nicely the most fundamental part of algebraic topology, the boundary maps, which give us the bulk boundary correspondence. And then I suppose I probably will run out of time. So I will just give you a, a very short overlook about the numerical invariants, which come out of this, like Z mod two invariants or Z invariants. But I start with a disclaimer, namely what is nowadays also a very active area of research is to look at interacting fermions in a solid. The theory of Jean Belissard is a one particle approximation where there's no interaction of fermions. And this theory is right now being developed. You need second quantization and you study the topology of the ground state and you use a higher category to do that. And I will not at all say anything about this although probably you will be very interested in this with your background. Mm. So let's start. Let me just start. What is a topological insulator? Okay, so here you have a slab of a material I drew it in two dimensions. And let's suppose that this is an insulator in the following sense. If I put an excess uh, of electrons here and there, so I put a battery if you want, right? Then there will be no current flowing from, from the minus to the plus. And so there's no current. 
It's insulating deep inside. That's what we call an insulator. Mm. There's no charge transport. However, if this material is in a state which is called a, a non-trivial topological phase, then there will be currents mm. along the boundary. They have to be there due to the non-trivial nature of the phase. And they cannot be suppressed they are persistent against, they are persistent against uh, deformation and their conductivity is quantized. So that's a very interesting phenomenon. And uh, the, the challenge is to, to describe this by means of, of topology, by means of non-commutative topology. So let me uh, just come to the mathematical description of what is an topological phase in the one particle picture. But there, there's somebody who wants to be admitted, right? I admit him. Okay, so we start to describe the material deep inside the, uh, deep, deep inside, we, we uh, start to, to describe the electrons deep inside the materials and that's called the bulk. Okay, so it's described by a configuration space which doesn't have a boundary. So it's a, a D-dimensional Euclidean in space or in the uh, discrete tight binding approximation, it's a discrete space, a ZD. And then the interaction is uh, integrated out if you wish and gives rise to an effective potential, which is felt by the particles, which then become quasi-particles, single quasi-particles, and so I described them by a standard Schrodinger equation uh, by in the uh, usual, in the continuous case by a Laplacian plus a potential. In the tight binding approximation, it would be a discrete Laplacian uh, with hopping parameters plus a potential. Importantly, we have a certain amount of internal degrees of freedom, which describes spin or other things, pseudo spin. So you can think of some examples being the Landau Hamiltonian for free electron and magnetic field. I won't write this down. Or it's discrete approximation, which is called the Hofstadter Hamiltonian. There are other very instances where I don't have a magnetic field. And this gave rise to the uh, wake of research into topological insulators, started perhaps by Kane and Neelip. So mathematically, the main assumption is that the system is insulating in the bulk, which translates physically to the fact that my Hamiltonian uh, has a gap in its spectrum and that the Fermi energy lies in that gap. Uh, the Fermi energy lying in that gap means that the spectral states below the gap, they are all filled and above the gap, they are empty. So that's an insulator. The filled bands are separated by the unfilled bands by a gap. And now the definition of a topological phase is simply to say that two models or two materials described by two Hamiltonians H0, H1 belong to the same topological phase if they can be deformed, preserved in the gap. And mathematically, this means that I need to have a continuous path linking H0 with H1, staying gapped inside a topological space, which I call A. And that's important that I really be aware that there is a topological background space, which is there, which I have to specify. And the way I will specify it, I mean, the philosophy of Jean Belissard would be to say, okay, well, this background space is just the C star algebra, which is naturally assigned to the system. It's, it's the observable algebra of the bulk system. So now I will sort of more or less never talk about Hamiltonians. I will only talk about homotopy classes, right, of elements in a C star algebra. And I will talk more about the C star algebra than about Hamiltonians.
I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, are we restricting to non-interacting Hamiltonians or? Yes. Okay. I said here that uh, uh, in the one particle approximation, I have an effective potential which takes into account all the electron electron interaction. So we are restricting to a model where I have a single particle in the background potential. Okay, thank so you. if you wish, the electron electron interaction has become uh, integrated out into an effective theory. Yeah, Renoir? I don't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, um, I have to, um... Um, yeah, I wanted to, to ask you, uh, uh, in the definition of A, uh, how do you encode the fact that it is a non-interacting system? Uh, uh, can't one deal with interacting system simply by uh, uh, changing the uh, C-star algebra A, for, for example? Uh, because it seems that you're working in a fairly general uh, setting. So, um, uh, what distinguishes in this respect C star algebras for interacting versus those for non-interacting particles? Yeah, okay, so there, there is a theory about interacting systems. It's also based on a C star algebra, but you include into that uh, a second quantization. So the difference is that I don't second quantize. And in a, in a way, what if I just say I use a C star algebra, I haven't decided that I do only one particle approximation. Mm -hmm. When I say I do only one particle approximation, then I mean that I'm looking at a Hamiltonian, a bounded operator, or one uh, mm -hmm. which is made bounded of a C star algebra, as opposed to a second quantized theory where mm -hmm. the Hamiltonian would have interaction terms and would be unbounded, which is much more complicated. Mm. And it's not clear how to use K-theory in that context. Okay, thank you. So it's because I want to follow K-theory that I restrict to the case where I just have a Schrodinger equation of one particle. Okay, so here's how the C-star algebra is constructed, okay? So I do it for the type binding approximation because it's technically a little bit simpler but it can be made also for the continuous case. So when the space is by approximation where I look at configuration space being discretized, being a lattice that D. And you know, that means that you essentially put uh, orbital orbital interactions. So then the C star algebra will be generated by, well, potentials, which are bounded functions, not all depending on my choice, but it's going to be a subalgebra of all bounded functions from Z to C. And these functions, think of them as potentials, okay? I need also translations because uh, momentum is the infinitesimal generator translations. So when I go over to a discrete uh, type binding model, then momentum operator becomes just translation operator. So I have D translations, Ti psi shifts it by a lattice vector. And they are unitary. If I have a magnetic field, they don't necessarily compute, commute, they commute up to a phase factor. And the fact that they shift just, uh, they translate the wave functions just means that by conjugation, they translate the potentials. So these two relations are crucial. They essentially define my algebra. Now, as I said already before, we will have to uh, need to include internal degrees of freedom like spin or zero spin. So there will be an internal Hilbert space, which I suppose to be uh, finite dimensional. So that's a restriction which I make. And then of course the uh, interactions in the eternal space, they are simply described by a finite dimensional matrix algebra. And so my algebra actually can be seen as the algebra generated 
as written here, which is the algebra A prime, tensor with the degrees of freedom for the eternal space. So this algebra is just this tensor product. Now, if you are aware of this, then I just tell you that uh, this algebra A prime, which is described by these uh, commutation relations or by these relations, this is something which is very well known in mathematics since a long time. It's a, it's a cross product algebra. It's sort of a mingle between the potential functions and the translations. I write it like this because it's, it's more functorial and K-theory is functorial and the, the form of this algebra is very important in what follows. Could I ask a question? Alpha in this relation, sorry. Yeah. What is the parameter alpha in, in this relation that you write now? Oh, this alpha just means that uh, uh, the action of the translation operator is by translation and the alpha just encodes the translation. Uh, so there another a question, question yeah. if, if possible. Um, uh, so physically speaking, do you allow here potentials that could have infinitely many derivatives? So essentially it's something non-local. Uh, well, derivatives is, is difficult because on, on, a, on, a, on a discrete space. Yes, but you are speaking about translations twisted by magnetic field. I thought the idea was that if you have magnetic field, then the interaction could involve some derivatives. Uh, ah, okay. So, so if you have the, I, I'm not sure whether I understand this question, but if if you have the the continuous model, right, which exists also, right, then uh, the momenta would be become covariant with 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 uh, the magnetic fields would be uh, described by um, vector potentials, and then I have to replace the partial derivatives by covariant derivatives. Is that the question? I, I'm not really sure. Ah, okay. So I, I see here when you speak about translations, is this on some uh, on z to the d? Yes. Or, ah, okay. Thanks. Yeah, but all this uh, again, all this is is to simplify technically what happens. Okay, so you can do it also with the continuous model, but then you have to be analytically much more careful let's put it this way okay so that 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 is now my algebra in the discrete case so let me give some examples so having uh, then this algebra has the form so translations internal degrees of freedoms i can now have different opinions of, of on what are my allowed potentials Okay, now I could say one possibility, I take all possible bounded potentials. So this algebra here is all bounded functions on the lattice. And then this would mean that I would consider uh, all possible local tight binding operators, which have at most n internal degrees of freedom. Local meaning that the hopping parameters to the neighbors, to the next nearest neighbors, and so on and so forth, they become smaller and smaller. Okay. So a next near neighbor model, uh, a near nearest neighbor model would be fit perfectly in here, but I could also have next nearest interactions if and so on. If I do this, however, I can do this. This algebra here. It's very, very complicated from a point of view of mathematics. It's a commutative algebra whose spectrum is the stone check compactification of ZD, which is a non separable space. So A is a non separable algebra, and non separable algebras have usually very poor K theory. So that is a choice which is taken by some but not my favorite. In physics, it seems to be most people take the point of view that I can describe everything with crystals, in which case uh, my potentials are periodic. And then if I put the elementary cell, treat the elementary cell as internal degrees of freedom, so it's a periodic repetition of an elementary cell and each elementary cell 
has finitely many states in this approximation. Then I could say my potential functions, they're all constant. And then this algebra would be just the num complex numbers, all constant potentials. And then I can do a Bloch Fourier transformation. And this would give, tell me that this algebra is nothing else than the continuous functions on the Brion zone, which is uh, the detorus, which are matrix valued. If you look into the literature of one particle approximation in physics, this is always the algebra. So it's a very simple algebra in a way. And it's based on a commutative space if I have no magnetic field. Right? And so uh, the twisted K theory of the torus would play a role. Now, Jean Bélissard, when he started to study all this, he was interested in quasi crystals. And if you do quasi crystals, then also you would restrict this potentials to quasi periodic uh, potentials. I don't want to uh, describe how this exactly goes, but I, I mention it here because it's really for me the historical starting point. Jean Belissa wanting to describe quasi crystals. And if you remember the, the talks he gave, he always talks about the hull and Actually, this potential functions, which are quasi-periodic, they are just have this property that they correspond to continuous functions on some uh, topological space, which is called the hull of the quasi-crystals. And these, these spaces they are very complicated and they have very rich K-theory. Johannes? Yeah. It's uh, Jean-Noël speaking. I, I, I just have a short question. Yeah. Uh, in in case two, uh, do you include the case with a, a, a lattice with a basis? Yeah, it's 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 the case of a lattice with a basis, but here I actually uh, turned off the magnetic field. All the magnetic field would be rational. But I mean, do, do you explicitly include the fact that there could be several sites within the unit cell? Yes, that would yes. be in this N here. I would put them all into the matrix part. Okay, so the internal space would be the degrees of freedom of an elementary cell, which I suppose to be finite. And then the rest is the translations, which give me the Brion zone. Okay. I lost it. I suppose it's okay. So now uh, let me just argue how we now naturally find K theory. And I follow uh, an, uh, an article of mine and, and of Kubota. So the Fermi energy, as I said, was uh, crucial because it decided which bands are filled and which bands are not filled. So I will shift it for convenience to zero by adding a constant to the Hamiltonian. Then saying that the Hamiltonian is gapped, so it's insulating, is equivalent to saying that it is invertible because if, if I have a zero, which is not in the spectrum, then this is nothing else than saying that H is invertible. And now after this shift, bands below energy zero are filled and above they are unfilled. And here's a dull example of a Hamiltonian of a tight branding approximation. Take H equal to the constant function one. That's a Hamiltonian for which all the belts are completely unfilled because all the spectrum is above zero. And if I take the Hamiltonian to be minus one, then all the bands are completely filled. Can I maybe Nothing ask another question? Sorry. Uh, would not be possible that uh, zero is not an eigenvalue, but you, there's a dense eigenvalue that approach zero and then there's not really a gap. Yes, but then it would not be uh, an insulator. Yeah, so then there's no equivalence between being invertible and having a gap. Oh, oh no, there, there, there's, uh, no, 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 no. If, if the spectrum is closed, so if zero is not in the spectrum, then there's an open set which contains zero which is not in the spectrum. Okay, so it is not. So 
let me define now, therefore, what, mathematically an insulator. Well, it's nothing else than a GL, so for general linear, it's, for, it's an invertible element of the algebra, which is self-adjoint uh, because uh, Hamiltonians are self-adjoint. So this is my uh, space. And the topological phase is a connected component of this space, right, of this open set. It's an open subset of the algebra. Now, there is one operation which, which plays often a, a role, namely uh, spectral flattening, which means that I contract the spectrum above zero to one and below zero to one, okay? And it's just a simple observation that uh, inside this space, I always can contract, find a continuous path to a self-adjoint unitary, okay? So, Hamiltonians are self adjoint and they are unitary because spectrum is contracted to plus one and minus one. And though now let me define K theory by means of this definition. The K theory is just this modulo homotopy turned into an abelian group. So, how does this look? I, I'm, I'm going to be more precise now. It, for this, I need actually two operations, stabilization and the Grotenkrieg construction. These are standard mathematical tools. So I don't want to, I don't, I don't mean that you have now to understand how this works, but just it's totally standard. So it's a natural reflex when you have this space to turn it to an, to turn this space into an abelian group by stabilization and quotient leak. So stabilization means that I can look instead of elements of A, also at the elements of the matrices with entries in A. And this for any size of the matrix, because I can say that if I have a matrix which is n cross n, then I embed it into the matrix which is n plus one cross n plus one, by putting a one at the lower right of the diagonal. And physically, this means that I add uh, unfilled bands because we saw that one is a tight binding operator which has only unfilled bands. And Grotendieck, Grotendieck, I mean, sorry, if you do this, then you gain, and that's the main You gain that you now the operation, you now have the structure of an abelian semigroup. Homotopy classes can be added by just uh, uh, adding representatives uh, with the help of the direct sum operation. So writing x above to the left and y below to the right. And Grotendieck is a method to uh, obtain negative elements, so inverses which then means that we actually also add filled bands, which we add also minus ones. Okay, and so this is very, very natural from the point of view of physics. And there is, this is my definition of K0. And then a topological space of an insulator is nothing else than an element of the K0 group of A. With a slightly weaker sense, I have to say, because the slightly weaker sense uh, says that we allow to add unfilled bands and to add filled bands. But that's accepted. Actually, physically, uh, the way you add these bands, is it by um, uh, increasing the number of internal degrees of freedom, for, for example? Yes. Or yes. That's a good way to visualize uh, this process yeah. Stabilization. Exactly. Okay. Because I, I, I take larger and larger matrix algebras, this can be exactly understood as taking more, more and more internal degrees of freedom. Okay. So Sorry, now, Bernard, do you, excuse me, Bernard, do you have a question? You raised your hand. Uh, yes, uh, it's a very trivial remark this Grotten deconstruction. This Grotendieck construction is uh, what we use for uh, 
defining a, a cafeteria fiber bundles, but also what everybody uses to define the Z, uh, in, in positive and negative integers or the rational numbers from integer positive numbers. So this should be taught in school uh, at very early age. Yeah. So you think I shouldn't have mentioned it? No, you should uh, insist that it should be taught in elementary schools. Yeah, OK. Sorry. So I insist it should be taught in elementary schools. Um, OK, now, now symmetry projection, because uh, that's something which uh, uh, was, sort of that, uh, was, was uh, uh, kicked off by, by Kane Miele when they uh, discovered you, that you can have topological phases, or actually by Hal Haldane already, when he discovered that you can have topological phases without magnetic fields. So I can have symmetry, and there are different concepts of symmetry in my mind. First, there, there are ordinary symmetries, which are just given by a representation of a group in terms of C linear automorphisms of the algebra. It's important that these are C linear usually, and uh, the Hamiltonian is just invariant. So that's what I call an ordinary symmetry. And there's a very easy way to implement them. You just say, okay, we are going to restrict to G invariant elements. I think now in the back of my mind, I will always have done this. So now I sort of replace my algebra A if I have symmetries which I want to impose by its G invariant sub algebra. And the other thing I already mentioned was quasi periodicity. And I already mentioned that if we have quasi periodicity, if we impose quasi periodicity, then this amounts to restricting the possible potentials to quasi periodic functions. But the fun comes from extraordinary symmetries. And the, the extraordinary symmetries, these are time reversal symmetry, charge conjugation, and chiral symmetry. And what is extraordinary? Well, extraordinary is that they are either anti-linear. So I have an automorphism, which is a real linear map, and I is transformed to minus I. It's of order two, and the Hamiltonian is invariant. So that's time reversal symmetry. In mathematics, such operations they are very well known, they are called real structures. So a real structure and then there is another extraordinary symmetry is a charge conjugation or a particle hole symmetry. It's also given by something anti-linear of order two. So it's also a real structure, but it uh, it's not a symmetry of the Hamiltonian, it's a it's an anti-symmetry. The Hamiltonian is transformed to minus it. And the third, the chiral symmetry, is a standard uh, automorphism, the C linear automorphism of order two, which also uh, doesn't leave H invariant, but gives it a minus sign. So this is also something which is very known, well known in in, in mathematics in this context, it's simply a grading. If I have a chiral symmetry, then I have a grading, which means my algebra is Z mod two graded. And I call it balanced because I always require that there is at least one element which satisfies this relation. So for instance, a trivial grading um, is not balanced. Okay, now we just include them, these symmetries, uh, in a very um, obvious way. We were talking about the invertible elements, which are self adjoint. These are my insulators. And I just add the requirement that they satisfy the relations with respect to the extraordinary symmetry. And then I, I define a K group by just the same, in the same way as before, essentially, except that I require to have the bond relations with, uh, the good relations with, with respect to extra symmetry. 
Now, there's a little detail about this. Therefore, I would like to make that clear. It's, it's something which really was invented in 84 by Van Dahle in mathematics. Namely, suppose now that we have a, a chiral symmetry so that we talk about a balanced graded algebra. Then the identity will no longer satisfy my symmetry requirements because the identity is not an anti-invariant under the chiral symmetry. It's actually odd with respect to the grading. Uh, it's, it's even with respect to the grading. So I cannot really use this construction. I therefore need something else. I, I replace the identity by some choice of odd element, which is a self adjoint unitary. It's like I choose another base point to, con to, to for instance, the definition of the, of the fundamental group of a, of a space. I take a choice of base point, and that's a little bit like this here also. And this choice now enters into the definition of the stabilization. Right? So I cannot stabilize with the identity because the Hamiltonian, which corresponds to the identity, is not invariant under chiral symmetry. So that makes this a little bit more complicated, but not drastically. Johannes? Yeah. Could you give an, a physical example of, of this uh, graded balance symmetry? Well, the physical standard example is, is the model of Haldane, which is a periodic model where in the elementary cell you have two points, and then you have an interaction between these two points, which uh, makes that if I interchange them, then the Hamiltonian changes its sign. But in terms of relativistic field theory, for example, you don't have in mind the chiral symmetry of, of, of Dirac fermions in four dimensions, right? I, I have in mind chiral symmetry. Uh, yeah. of, so, so, so there, there are uh, you, the yeah, some, something be, like this, yeah. The Hamiltonian uh, would be invariant and not, not sent to minus itself if you act with, the, with ordinary chiral symmetry, no? With gamma phi, you'd say. Or maybe I'm just confused. Well, then that, that, that means that, that I am not in, that, that I shouldn't look uh, to four dimensions, then I should look for, for something which is anti invariant. Okay, well, well, thanks for the other example anyway. Maybe I, I have one, you mentioned particle hole symmetry. Yeah. How did you what you just said, but I'm just not sure. How can you just add an empty band if you want to preserve particle hole symmetry? Well, that's precisely the point. So Sorry. that's why I need, I cannot do the construction with the empty band for particle hole symmetry. I need to find a substitute. Okay. okay. So the theory becomes now relative, right? So while it is rather obvious that uh, the trivial Hamiltonian equal uh, that, that one h equal to one should be considered to be trivial from a topological point of view, it's not obvious what would be a trivial topologically trivial uh, uh, Hamiltonian with particle hole symmetry. So this is to be debated. And as long as we don't have this concept, the theory would be relative, meaning that I don't have a notion of an absolute topological phase but I have a notion of relative topological space. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now perhaps the most exciting part in the beginning of the story was that when I have these extraordinary symmetries that I get exactly 10 symmetry types. And these 10 symmetry types, they are related to Clifford algebras and they are related to what periodicity in K theory. So let me explain this a little bit. So I need a Clifford algebra. So this here, so that's, that's, that's Clifford with R uh, generators, which are uh, real and S generators, which are imaginary, imaginary. 
Uh, don't, this is the Clifford algebra with R real and S imaginary generators. If I'm not interested in real structures, so that would be uh, a Clifford algebra with this real structure, then this Clifford algebra as a complex Clifford algebra is the same than the complex Clifford algebra of R plus S generators. So these Clifford algebras, they, they play a role. You can reorganize these K theories with extraordinary symmetries in terms of Clifford algebras and higher degree K groups. So let me suppose for that, because that simplifies, that the extraordinary symmetry, they act only on the internal degrees of freedom. So it would mean that this internal degrees of freedom I have on this matrix algebra, I have real structure and a grading. So I suppose now I have a grading gamma, so I have a chiral symmetry. Then my algebra, which mixes the internal degrees of freedoms, is graded. That's a graded algebra. It's actually balanced graded. And there's a little theorem which shows you that it's therefore uh, isomorphic to the matrix algebra with half the size tensor, the Clifford algebra with two generators. And the grading is simply the Pauli, the Pauli sigma three matrix uh, on this complex Clifford algebra. And the theory says that there are now exactly four real structures up to equivalence, which commute with this grading. And these four real structures, they are nicely related to the four possibilities which I have as extraordinary uh, symmetries. One called the even time reversal symmetry, where the real subalgebra is just obtained by taking a complex conjugation of the coefficients in the algebra. So one type of symmetry is just saying that uh, uh, I take the real structure, which is entry-wise complex conjugation, and the real subalgebra is just real matrices. And this is isomorphic as a graded algebra to essentially a matrix algebra times Clifford 1, 1. And the other four cases, they correspond to these four real structures. So you should go through the extraordinary symmetries and require that they have a chiral symmetry then these algebras, the real subalgebras, they naturally exhaust all the real Clifford algebras where I have an even number of generators up to Morita equivalence. And that's, that's the main message why I have now a classification of symmetry types by a Clifford algebras, because the standard definition of a higher K group is that if I have to find one K group, then I can get a K group with an index a bit complicated. I have to say one plus S minus R simply by tensoring on uh, a Clifford algebra RS. So this is following the standard way to define higher degree K groups once I have defined one degree K group. If you do this, uh, for the case where we have no real symmetries, then you find that uh, this K group is just the standard K group of a complex algebra in degree one. It's complex K theory, it's bot two periodic. And uh, if I have real symmetries, then I have, well, not to surprise, real K theory. So this is just this K group. And it's eight periodic bot. Now, to complete this classification, uh, I have to consider the case where I do not have chiral symmetry. And if I don't have chiral symmetry, then I have a 
then I have to make a trick and I, I just add an outer grating. I replace A by A tensor with the Clifford algebra. And then I will cut the story short. I will find that uh, without uh, chiral symmetry, I have again four possible real structures, which are again given by these four possible combinations of extra order symmetries. And so the Clifford algebra exhausts now all Clifford algebras with odd number of generators. So again, if I do not have a symmetry at all, not even a real one, then the trick was adding a Clifford algebra. And then, so the, the K theory without symmetry is just the standard K zero group of the complex algebra. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused. I thought I was taught at school that the representations of, Carol, of Clifford algebras always have an even number of generators. What am I missing here? Uh, I don't talk about uh, representation. Oh, yeah. Okay, here, you, you, you missed the trick, I think that's it. I, you missed the trick that uh -huh. if I do not have a chiral symmetry, then I tensor on a Clifford one, which means that the fiber is no longer a simple matrix algebra, but the fiber is a matrix algebra tensor Clifford one. Uh, the Clifford one is, Clifford one is C plus C. Does it correspond to choosing a quadratic form, which is the generate uh, in one direction? No, I think generators is oh. in the multiplicative sense. So it's a dimension, if you want, where you are talking about the linear definition of generators. Oh, so it's just the number of fermions then, in physical language. Dimension of the, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Dimension, uh, okay, 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 thanks. So let me uh, give me a first summary uh, and comments. Uh, I have to speed up, I think a little bit. So uh, physical considerations uh, lead to a choice of the background algebra A. And this algebra describes the physics in the bulk. And then I can add symmetry and the symmetry pro protected topological phases. They can be identified with elements of this K group, which I have defined. And I can reorganize these K groups as being actually different degree K groups of different degrees classical K groups of my algebra. So in the commutative case, so that this is for crystals, then these K groups they can be described by vector bundles with symmetries. And uh, this is exactly what Fried and Moore did in their article about twisted K theory applied to, I think the article was called twisted equivariant matter. So what I did here, if you wish, is what they did in the commutative case, but for non-commutative algebras. And I also would like to mention that uh, Kitaev in 2007, he already realized that uh, uh, there is a periodic table underlying the topological insulators. And if you take as the algebra, the potentials being constant, uh, but it's not the tight binding approximation, it's the continuous version. So it's a very simple algebra. If you take this algebra here, then you get exactly the Kitayev table. So I just uh, show you, this is the Kitayev table. He, which gives you for all combinations of symmetries, which some, sometimes are associated to certain classes, uh, according to the Cartan classification, the, the, the K groups. So these are the possible K groups. So what we have done here, we have sort of the analog of the Kitayev table for any kind of algebra A. Well, that's sort of the first part about the bulk. I want to go over to the boundary yeah, because uh, the- Johannes, uh, uh, again, for what kind of potentials or your uh, results, uh, uh, I mean, um, 
uh, holding because you you mentioned that Kitayev uh, well worked with uh, actually the, the the periodic case, so you uh, allow for um, non periodic potentials. But but what is the, yes, the plus yes. exactly? Uh, well, uh, it depends each time on the algebra. So I can essentially take any subalgebra of the algebra of bounded potentials. Any such algebra will give me a table. So I can take any kind of bounded potential structure. And, and of course, uh, the classification can um, be very subtle if you're dealing with, say, quasi-periodic potentials, or uh, is there anything, for example, as explicit as the Kitayev table, if you have a quasi-periodic potentials, for, for example? Yeah, you could uh, specify, uh, let's take the Penrose tiling, take potentials which are defined on the Penrose tiling, then uh, you can compute the, the eight K groups which come out of this. Then you would have, if you wish, this, this column here, which is, oh, sorry, now I made a, a bit easier. Then, then you would get this column for the dimension two for the Penrose tiling. You can calculate it. It's very complicated, but feasible. Is that, does this answer the question a bit? I hope. Okay, let's go to the boundary now. The important thing for me is that I can, using K-theory, really relate the fact that the system is bulk insulating with the fact that I have these resonances on the boundary, which are persistent against perturbation. For this, I need now to look at a new algebra, which describes the physics near the boundary. And the idea is to say, if I have a material with a boundary, then instead of putting it on a space without boundary, I put it on a space with boundary. So the D's coordinate is chopped off. It's only the positive values of this coordinate. That's very natural. And now what happens if I just would take my algebra A and would let it represent on this space, where here uh, I only restrict to positive coordinates, then, then the these, the perpendicular translation that, that runs against the wall, which is here. And so it's at joint will no longer be injective. And the only modification between the algebra for the system with boundary and boundary is in the fact that it's no longer injective. The first line is exactly the same. I take all bound, I take bounded potentials. The third line is also the same. But, oh, there's a, there's a misprint here. Sorry, there's a misprint. I have a new relation here. It's this relation. And this is actually true only if i is equal to d. For all the other i's, I have the same relation as before. So this projection here is simply the projection onto the wall, onto the boundary. So it's a projection onto coordinates which have these coordinates zero. And this exactly says me the defect of the translation, the perpendicular translation being not injective. So, well, of course, man, now there is a little bit of mathematics, but there is a C star algebra which is generated by this new relations. And it's very well known in mathematics. It's called the triplets extension of the cross product algebra. It's physically very reasonable, I find, and mathematically very well known. So we are really on good track. So now I, would like to describe the interaction of these two algebras. How are they related? And what does this tell us about the boundary? <laughs> 
So I can think of the operation of shifting the boundary to plus infinity as being given by an algebra homomorphism, which sort of goes from the half space algebra to the bulk algebra, and which just restores my uh, old uh, commutation relations. So it just would say that, uh, so the T hats here, I recall the T hats uh, were my new translations, my translations on half space, and they had just this P zero different as a relation. And so when I say that I make a T hat into a T one, then this means that my Q, my algebra morphism has a kernel, which I call G. And this kernel is just what's generated by this projection onto the wall, onto the boundary. So here, this, this algebra here describes the operators which are localized at the boundary. Well, this is also a subjective morphism. And so what I get here is what's called an exact sequence. Uh, I get the subjective morph uh, uh, subjective morphism to here, whose kernel is the J. And the, the whole point of the story is that in algebraic topology, whenever I have an exact sequence, I get a long exact sequence of K groups. And this looks as follows in the degree and the place where I'm interested in. Uh, the K theory of A modulo what comes on the level of K theory from the middle is identified, is isomorphic to the K theory of the ideal uh, intersected with the kernel of this map induced on K theory. That's the K theoretical bulk boundary correspondence. And I, I claim that this is responsible for the fact that I have resonances on the boundary, which are persistent. In principle, you can draw ed everything from this relation. So we understood what this is because I motivated it. It's, it's, it was just given by uh, insulators, homotopy classes of insulators with this extraordinary symmetry. But what is this here? Uh, at first sight, you could think that should be insulators, which are localized at the bounds. We will see that this is related rather to things on the boundary where the gap is closed. Here we have a gap, it's an insulator. Here we have current, the gap is closed. It's a very good conductor. So, 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 so I would like to explain what is actually this group here. And there I follow now an idea which has been advocated by uh, Aldrich, Max, and Sernbauer to describe the boundary not by uh, the K theory formulation of Van Dahle, which I explained, but rather by the K theory, uh, by the K -theory formulation of Kasparov in terms of KK groups. And then you will simply find that, well, if you if you look at, at, the, at the linear map, which restores, which goes from a translation on, on full space to a translation on half space, so that's not going to be an algebra map, it's just a linear map. Then on the level of Hamiltonians, this means that we replace our Hamiltonian by a Hamiltonian on a half space, and a Hamiltonian on a half space is nothing else than the Hamiltonian which we had together with boundary conditions. So going from the bulk algebra to the half space algebra, we just add boundary conditions. And the, the message is that this is exactly this bulk boundary correspondence map. It's just adding boundary conditions, but viewing this now in KK theory. Uh, 
So let me convince you. I mean, this, this is what I wanted. I wanted to convince you why is it now very, very natural to look at Kasparov's formulation of K theory. So let me in five minutes crash course about KK theory, or let's K theory and KK theory. What is this about? Well, the first step is you replace Hilbert spaces by Hilbert C star modules. And this means that the scalars are replaced by a C star algebra. Just do this exercise. Do as if the complex numbers are replaced by a C star algebra, then you get a Hilbert C star module. It means that the scalar product now is B valued. It means that the dimension becomes rank. So if I take B, this is a Hilbert C star module. The scalar product is just taken Scalar product of A with B is just taking uh, A star B. So then, then B replaces the idea of a one dimensional Hilbert space. So this is a rank one model. And according to this no notion of rank, I have now finite rank operators. Okay. And when I have finite rank operators, I take the closure, I have compact rank operators, compact operators, or B compact operators. It really follows the same logics. It's just the closure of the finite rank operators where rank is defined in this way, not through dimension of the Hilbert space. I have the notion of an adjoint, which is now with respect to this scalar product. And an endomorphism on such a Hilbert B model is just a linear map which admits an adjoint. Well, technically, this is nevertheless much more subtle. For instance, you do not have always an adjoint for an operator. Okay, and then, then we can make pairs to make Kasparov cycles. So a Kasparov CB cycle is a pair, it's a, it's a Hilbert uh, C star module, together with a, if you wish, it's a sort of a generalized Fretom operator which is a self-adjoint endomorphism of the C star module, such that the square minus one is B compact. These can be added by taking the direct sum. Now, if the square root is equal to one, then uh, you call that degenerate. And the cusp EB group, is taking KK cycles, modulo three types of equivalence. One is homotopy, then unitary equivalence, and adding of degenerate KK cycles. Well, of course, technically, there is a lot more to be said about this, but written like this, putting all the technical details under the carpet, it's very obvious just replace the complex numbers by a C star algebra. So how can I encode extraordinary symmetries? Well, essentially in the same way as I did before by just requiring my objects to be invariant, okay? So in particular, the, the fretal operator should, be, uh, uh, should, should, should have the good relations with these extraordinary symmetries. Okay, so that's Kasparov KK theory or KK CB theory together with symmetries. Now, you can realize, I should say that uh, it is well known that these two groups are isomorphic, but until now, I would say this isomorphism was not very explicit. We managed to give a very explicit isomorphism between the Fandale formulation and the Kasparov formulation. I'm not going into that. I think it's a little late. But what's important is uh, the boundary invariant now is really an element of 
KK theory. So just to remember, we started with the bulk algebra A, with the insulator in A. So this one is uh, invertible and self-adjoint. So it has a spectral gap at zero. Let's this P delta H hat be the spectral projection of the operator with boundary conditions to the gap. And the, the whole point will be that this is not zero because there will be spectrum in the gap. If I would put here H, then this would be zero by definition. But it's not zero for the one with boundary conditions. So I'm now looking at the uh, part of my operator with boundary conditions, which is restricted to this gap. And this is the KK class. And uh, the bike boundary condition, uh, bike boundary correspondence is exactly this map. Take the class of the Hamiltonian in the Fandala group, take this class of the Hamiltonian with boundary conditions in the KK group. Okay, so now maybe that's sort of the last thing I will really say is. Why does it give me the physical interpretation that boundary currents are persistent if my insulator is topologically non-trivial? Okay. Again, here we have the insulator, which has a spectral grep. It's mapped to a KK class using the Hamiltonian on the half space with boundary conditions projected to the spectral part in the gap. Now, if this class is not in the image of this, this map, which uh, was on the left here, uh, so we, sorry, let me just come back to this. So if this class here is not zero, given that delta is an isomorphism, this class here is not zero. So if this class is not in this image, then the spectrum must cover the gap at zero, which means that there must be resonances states which are localized at the boundary. These resonances cannot propagate into the bulk and they cannot be destroyed by bending and denting. They're stable against perturbation. So let me prove that, right? Suppose that the spectrum of this half space operator possibly this operator is homotopic to an operator whose square is one because I can open up this spectrum at zero. And therefore it defines a degenerate KK cycle. And therefore this class is zero, which of course contradicts that we had an isomorphism. So this proves this part. The second part is proven simply by the observation that the bulk spectrum, uh, uh, that, that, the, that the insulator has a gap. So there is no spectrum in the bulk in the gap. And so there cannot be anything there. And the third part is really, if you, perturb something at the boundary, then what happens in the bulk will not be touched. So the non-triviality of this class is independent on what happens on the boundary. I can do what I want to the boundary. I will not be able to change this non-triviality. And therefore the resonances are persistent. Okay. So now a little question. I think uh, it's a, a, a quarter past. I have a couple of more slides. How is it with timing? So I think we started five minutes late. So a couple of slides sounds like five minutes about. Does that work for you? Okay. Yeah, it works for me. But maybe do you have do 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 we have questions about this picture? Because this is really, mm -hmm. I think, the heart, in some sense. Mm -hmm. 
of the justification why K theory is so useful. Actually, yeah. I have a question, Johannes, from your uh, the description of uh, edge states related to these KK cycles. Uh, well, a physicist uh, tends to think of edge states as a model by some kind of massless Dirac fermions uh, most often. So the question is that is there any connection between KK theory at the edge and uh, uh, classification in some sense, I don't know, of massless Dirac Hamiltonians? Yes, there should be that. Mm -hmm. So, well, if you ask me whether I will be able to de deduce from H hat uh, a, a massless Hamiltonian on the boundary directly, I'm not sure about this. But what, what, you, what you can see, you can, can look at the dispersion relations uh, of, of H hat, and then you see the, the, dispersion, the dispersion relations. If you write them down, you see exactly the Dirac codes. And then if you would make a, a linear approximation at energy zero, then you should get uh, uh, an effective, yeah, you should get an effective Dirac. Maslow's Dirac. And do you think that KK theory provides a, a setting to analyze this process of linearization, for example, near these uh, Dirac points? Mm, I would think that it it's, it's, it's more abstract. It would give you directly classifications. So I, I don't think it's a technique to, um, to manipulate a Hamiltonian directly. So let me just uh, add two slides. Right, so the first would be a little uh, summary. Huh? So as I said, we, we have established a correspondence between bulk invariance and boundary invariance. And they're both naturally derived from the Hamiltonian of the system. And the way how they are formulated is very mathematical. It is a standard uh, approach of algebraic topology. So this is, I think, And say. Some questions related to this. <laughs> of course, in my argument, I would like to have an idea to decide whether I am in a topological non trivial phase, which then would allow me to deduce this boundary resonances. So that's a valid question. And somehow related to this question would be can we measure the invariance? So the answer will be, well, we can measure perhaps the invariance if we have topological, a numerical topological invariance. So what do I mean by a numerical topological invariant? Well, this is a group and given any linear map from the group into the complex numbers or into Z mod two, I would call this a numerical invariant because I could just apply, I take this map and I apply this map to my uh, K theory class. And since this is a topological invariant, I would get a topological invariant number. And then I could use this and for instance, find out that if I apply it to this class here, that it is non-zero. And so I could detect its non-triviality. But also, and that's very important and that has been very nicely demonstrated for the quantum Hall effect, the numerical invariants, they actually can be, in some cases, measured. They can be related to physical transport coefficients. So there 
I just give you an outlook how, how you would do that. Uh, there, there, there are two approaches to numerical invariance, and these are partly related through index theory. One is based on KK theory. Uh, so it's based on the fact if in the KK theoretic formulation, uh, I look at the K group, KKCA, there is also its dual, which is a K homology group, which is KKAC. So at this point, I'm very much cheating because I did not explain you how to define this group, but I just tell you that there's a way to, to define KK as something which holds for two algebras, which is so-called the B-variant uh, functor. And then the most powerful part of, of Kasparov's theory is that we actually have a, have a product, a Kasparov product, which gives you a sort of a pairing between the K group and the K homology group. So that produces a, a KK group where I go from C to C, U from R to R. And these are actually isomorphic either to integers or to more two integers or to zero. So you could understand this as a, as a numerical invariant. Could understand this as a numerical invariant. Uh, and uh, these have been studied for instance by Grossman and, and, and Schulz Beides. So an application would be, there is, in, for our algebras, there's always a standard uh, K homology class attached to our algebra. And D is the dimension. It's called the fundamental class. And this depends only on geometric data, not on the choice of potentials. It's really essentially the Dirac operator in momentum space. And since the, the theory is nicely uh, uh, functorial, there is also a boundary map on K homology and it's dual to the boundary map on K theory. And so if you combine these two, then you get an equality between numerical invariance from the numerical bulk boundary correspondence. So an application would be that here in the quantum hall effect, I would find the whole conductivity in the bulk. And here I would find the conductivity of the edge, edge, edge current. Okay. And let me just say that the other way to obtain numerical invariance is with cyclic cohomology, which is uh, in some sense, not a perfect dual theory, but it's closer related to uh, formulating invariance by generalization of the Ram cohomology. And uh, uh, so cyclic co cycle can be paired with, 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 with uh, K theory classes. This is how Jean Bellissard and Kohn did it long time ago for the integer, integer quantum Hall effect to show that this, uh, this invariant here, that this one here is actually the Hauer conductivity. By an index theorem, this, this invariant here is related to a pairing of a cyclic cohomology class with the K-theory class. So I didn't, didn't expand on all this because there's really a lot to say about this. And let me mention something which is relatively new, namely, uh, if you want to do this for Z2 invariants, so for K groups which have Z2 elements, then the cyclic cohomology approach doesn't work on the nose and you need to modify it to define secondary invariants. And then there are still a couple of open questions in particular related to the analog of the numerical bulk boundary correspondence. So the numerical bulk boundary correspondence for Z mod two invariants works only so far in the K homology picture, yep, in the cyclic cohomology picture. So that's sort of the outlook I wanted to give about numerical invariance, something which sort of also uh, maybe answers a little bit the question of Benoit, how 
we can uh, classify the rack cones. So let me stop here. Okay, so let's thank uh, Johannes for this very pedagogical talk. So we have time maybe for a few quick questions and then we can go off to lunch. Then why go ahead. Uh, yes, Johannes, uh, regarding to your last slide, um, do you mean that uh, uh, it would be important to have a, a cyclic cohomology interpretation of these Z2 invariants in order to uh, make predictions based uh, on linear response, for, for, for example, if you think about, for example, the, uh, the spin whole current, uh, whole current carrying spin, for example, in these uh, uh, Z2 invariant topological insulators, uh, if we want to compute these currents, uh, it would be a natural framework to, to use the, the cyclic cohomology, for, for example. Uh, yes. So, uh, there is a spin churn number formulation, right, which you mentioned for, for the k Nina model. Uh, well, actually not, uh, Emil Prodan proposed a spin churn number, which gives you a solution to how to calculate these uh, uh, cyclic cohomology pairings. If you have a spin operator, so a spin symmetry, which is additional, uh, now, what I did in this article was to show that on a K theoretic level, you always have such a spin operator. So there will always be a representative which will commute with a spin operator, and then you can commute, can calculate its spin churn number, and that would be the secondary pairing with, with the churn number. So it's important, yeah, as you say, it's important to do this. However, it does not yet solve what happens on this side. So there's still some questions, how to do, how to do the, the pairing with secondary classes of cyclic cohomology on this side. I see Boris has his hand up. Yes, well, uh, probably a naive question, but in this Kitayev table that you showed, also in this Kasparov pairing, all the invariants, uh, numerical invariants, seem to be valued in, in Z2 or 2Z. But I seem to remember that there is a final classification of topological insulators involving uh, you know, Z4, Z8, or Z16. How does that uh, fit in your framework, or, or do you need to invoke uh, higher form symmetries? So, so if I uh... If I guess correctly, what you mean, this would be results from uh, systems with interaction. I see. Yeah, so, so what, what happens is that, uh, for instance, if R Z valued, if you turn on the interaction, then there would be a, a homotopy, which would relate one, or which would relate the trivial, so zero to eight. So this is this is not in here. That that that's uh, something which you have if you use the interaction picture. Let's see, and the symmetries of the sister algebras that you consider would all, would they also include the higher form yeah. symmetries, which have played an important role recently, or or do they fall outside? I am not sure what you now mean by higher form symmetry. Well, some some symmetries where global charges would be carried by by extended operators like line operators or surface operators rather than uh, local operators. Well, yeah, I, I think I think that the um, you, I mean the, I think the, the research goes into this direction to include this into the uh, formulation with interaction using C star algebras, uh, which I just mentioned at the very beginning, but I don't see how you could do this. Mm -hmm in a context where you use K-theory. I think really that uh, it's probably you have to do higher category theory to describe this. Thanks. Okay, Benoit, you wanna go ahead? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe it's a more of a, of a outlook question. Uh, with all this um, technology work to, to tackle hinge states, Sorry? 
Oops. So uh, would this work for hinge states? You know, there's all these in the past couple of years or maybe just a few years, there's this discovery of new topological material that have hinge states. So there's a surface is gapped, but on the hinges are gapless modes. Uh, hinges is corners or, sorry. Um, you mean higher order topology insulators? Or? Yes, 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 exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, so higher topology insulators, uh, well, as far as I understand, they are related to corners. And this would require different extensions. So I had this tuplex extension, this tuplex extension, they does it only, uh, it does it only <clears throat> for, for standard co-dimension one effects. So if you want to have a co-dimension two effects, so you have, uh, you have the different extensions. So that's a little bit more complicated, but in principle doable. Thank you. Ivana, uh, I see you have a question. Thank you. Yes, if I am allowed to ask a baby question, it's similar to the previous one, but uh, in the Kitaya classification, you only get A, B, C, D. How about exceptional groups? Is it because you don't have the large N limit or how to how do you do it to get the exceptional groups? Uh, I um, so 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 the, the, the classification which was written where is, is the Cartan classification of homogeneous spaces. And it's incomplete. Uh, incomplete. Sorry? It's incomplete. It doesn't it's, have the exceptional ones. Yeah, so so I, I, I well I, I don't know why it doesn't have the exceptional ones. So thank you. I have to pass on that question. Okay, uh, I think it's getting late. Um, and we had a lot of questions. So let's thank you, Hannes, again for an excellent talk. Um, and I think we can.